I'd like to start by thanking Ilya and, and Natalia for, for the invitation and for uh, the arrangements, which have been extremely smooth, and to apologize for any difficulties I've caused with slow responses to emails. Um, so it's great to be here. It's a really nice uh, event. And uh, I'm going to be a bit out of joint with this session because I'm going to be speaking about um, what I'm calling deep er kernels and the uh, aim of what I want to try and examine and look at is the degree to which uh, kernel methods have to some extent looked into becoming deeper um, now and what we can learn from that and perhaps some of the uh, lessons uh, so but before I start I, I want to make clear that uh, I don't want to be criticizing deep learning in any fundamental way I mean the results we've heard about this morning are just astounding and clearly this is a technique that has enormous value to bring. But I think what I'm hoping to do in this presentation is to also examine a little bit about what uh, we can take from those, those uh, lessons into um, kernel methods, try to understand how we can improve them and make them, in a sense, uh, learn more of their uh, representation and results that have moved in that direction. So um, this is the background of I just said deep learning has uh, re-emerged as having an important research and commercial value. Uh, deep belief networks and related appro approaches have, have led this charge and uh, kernels uh, are referred to as shallow you know and uh, I'll explain you know, why this is. I'm sure you're clearly aware of why that is. But uh, uh, I would like to then understand how we can uh, make kernel learning uh, deeper or experiences that have, have done that. Um, so why, why is uh, kernel learning shallow? Uh, kernels learn nonlinear functions in the input space, so it would appear that they're as flexible as deep learning systems. But uh, the key point is that the... Uh, the nonlinearity is composed from a fixed nonlinear function followed by a learned linear function. And the point being that the only part that's learned is this output layer. And in that sense, the learning is shallow, um, whereas the functionality has a nonlinear component. So this is contrasted with deep learning, where parameters are spread across several layers. Um, with nonlinear transfer functions, as we've been seeing this morning, and uh, however, often learning in the deeper layers is 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 unsupervised, um, though in many cases also supervised. Um, and so, if they, occasionally you can have, you know, the actual uh, class uh, sort of supervised learning occurring only in the uh, later layers of the network. Um, so in that sense, this can be viewed as a sort of pre-learning of a representation um, and might be analogous to learning the kernel. So I'll be talking about you know, multiple kernel learning or learning the kernel as part of the moves that kernel uh, methods have made in this direction. So just before we get into anything of the uh, you know, sort of progress that has been made in, in terms of learning uh, kernel, uh, sorry, you know, uh, deeper learning in kernel methods. Uh, I just wanted to sort of review what actually happens in practice in the application of uh, kernel methods. And what I'm going to say here, some of these things are, in a sense, uh, already uh, superseded by the deep learning. But still, uh, I think it's important to understand the, the processes that uh, were followed or and are often still followed in applying kernel methods. So this is about applying kernel methods in practice. Um, so typically, we will, you know, use uh, some hyperparameters fixed by some heuristic. For instance, you know, the width of a Gaussian kernel might be fixed by the distance between the nearest uh, negative and positive example. Is one heuristic for that? Uh, we also use cross-validation to adapt hyperparameters to optimize performance on the particular task, whatever it might be, classification and regression. So in some sense, these are already attempts 
to learn that supposedly fixed mapping that uh, I referred to in that slide uh, where I showed the learning as being just the, the output layer. So in this sense, the, we are adapting the, um, the first supposedly fixed layer. Um, however, it's, it's a two-edged sword. You might say, okay, well, we're doing some deep learning, but this actually undermines the more principled approach that uh, you know, is, if you like, the hallmark or often seen as the hallmark of kernel methods in the sense that they're based on rigorous generalization bounds. Um, those bounds only apply if we take that first layer mapping as fixed. It relates only to the uh, output layer adaptation. If we allow that input layer, sorry, uh, fixed layer, uh, sorry, mapping, the nonlinear mapping to adapt, then the bounds as developed are no longer applicable. Um, and if we allow the, uh, the test data to be used to learn, for example, the, uh, the representation, then even test set bounds are no longer valid. So this is something that I think, you know, sort of people tend to forget that as they're applying their kernel methods, actually they're sort of undermining the, the principles under which they've been. So I'll be talking a little bit about that uh, in, later on. Um, <clears throat> But in addition to these sort of more straightforward applications of, of learning, there's also a much more sophisticated representations that are being developed. And this is sort of encoding deep prior knowledge, which have been learned by trial and error. So for instance, in, in, in uh, computer vision, uh, before people started using deep learning, they were often using uh, uh, models learned from histograms of patch clusters, um, uh, sorry, clustering of patches that were used in object detection. So, and maybe a Fisher kernel on top of that uh, from a you know Gaussian mixture model of of patches or or a clustering of patches. So these are you know insights that practitioners have had about how to represent images in this case, but other data similarly. So they've learned to do something that actually enhances the performance of the learning system. So in a sense, it is deep learning, but the, deep, the learning of the, the, the sort of representation has been a sort of part human, part machine uh, um, interaction. So what I want to do in this talk is present uh, a number of sort of promising directions that uh, address some of these issues. And uh, first, the idea that we learn a representation possibly tuned to the main learning task and therefore can be viewed as, as learning, uh, partly learning this uh, non-linear mapping. Um, any analysis that we have of the resulting system that supports its design and bounds its performance, so in other words that you know, come, overcomes that uh, weakness that I described of the fact that standard uh, generalization bounds only apply if that mapping is taken as fixed. And then some empirical evidence that supports the type of developments uh, that, we've, uh, that, are, that are described. Um, so I hope, I mean, I'm going to talk in a, a number of different directions, but I hope, and might appear initially disjointed, but I hope that you will get a, a sense that, uh, you know, deeper learning of kernels is, is alive and kicking, and, and, and I think there's uh, a lot of promise in this direction. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is matching pursuit. Um, so matching pursuit is a way of developing a representation through a greedy um, choice of training examples that determine the directions of the feature space that are well suited to the particular task and then deflate. So it's like growing a representation in a greedy fashion. Um, now, there's been uh, the reason I think it's quite an interesting direction is that uh, combining the sparse reconstruction idea um, one with generalization bounds, I, this is the first, I believe, bounds that have that apply to the complete pipeline of learning a representation and the performance of the corresponding classifier or regressor. Um, and uh, it also allows different criteria to be implemented in one framework. So we can do, within this framework of, of, of matching pursuits, you can do a sparse PCA, a classification, regression, canonical ca correlation analysis, etc. 
and all of them come with bounds, uh, as described in this paper. So the idea is you simply, because you're representing the, um, the representation, sorry, is, is constructed from a subset of the examples, we can use these sparse reconstruction results that simply sort of, if you like, guess what the correct uh, uh, indices of the examples to create the representation are. Under that guessing, the performance is good, and then you simply do a union bound over all the possible guesses, and provided the number of examples required to do the uh, reconstruction is small, we actually end up with quite uh, effective bounds. Um, so this is sort of the, the generic algorithm. It basically, I'm putting it again in kernel view. There's a, you know, two kernels, one for the two views, and uh, essentially there's a criterion, which in this case I think is for can canonical correlation analysis, but the cano this would be where you would uh, adapt to, you know, uh, address the particular um, task that you were trying to solve. You select greedily an index that uh, is the most optimal for the next uh, for, for, for the next stage and uh, you then reduce the uh, sorry deflate the two kernels relative to the uh, chosen index and then uh, once you've got the set of indices you then do a in this case a canonical correlation analysis on the subspace spanned by those that set of indices to in order to obtain the the, uh, the corresponding projections. We, we heard about that in the first talk, talk this morning, this use of canonical correlation analysis to learn a common project, projection. So this is just as an example, the kind of uh, uh, relationship between a, ba a bound, which is this red, and the empirical performance uh, of a one-dimensional projection. And, you know, it does seem quite reassuring that something of the structure of the real uh, generalization is captured in the bound. Um, so this is just to give an example, but uh, a, a relatively simple example. Um, but I'm now going to show you some results that have been obtained applying this type of uh, technique to um, reinforcement learning. So there's been some developments in reinforcement learning recently that have shown that if you take a kernel representation, um, you can learn the, both the uh, uh, system of the uh, operation of the um, state action interaction. The expectation operator is used here to learn uh, in an RKHS the expectation of the uh, mapping from you know, a state and an action to a new state. And uh, in addition, the reward function. So there are basically two places where learning uh, using kernel matching pursuit. There's this case in learning this uh, um, Q function and here in terms of sparsifying the policy. So in two cases we've uh, uh, this has been using kernel matching pursuit. There is a theory underpinning this so that uh, um, there are bounds based on the accuracy of the uh, approximation and and uh, the fit in order to bound the generalization performance. Um, this appeared, this particular approach of learning kernel matching pursuit appeared. Uh, Guy Levers, uh, my postdoc, and Ronnie Stafford's uh, PhD student in AI stats this year. Um, so this kind of makes a much more, if you like, principled way of um, doing reinforcement learning. Uh, it actually creates uh, a finite MDP that you need to solve by dynamic programming based on the selected examples that you've selected through the matching pursuit. And that solves the, uh, the main problem. So you sort of create a sub-problem by uh, selecting these examples. So clearly the more sparse you select, the easier it is to solve. And it's critical in order to make this work in practice that you do sub-select examples, and the kernel matching pursuit method appears to do that very effectively. So just to show you some examples of how that works out in practice, here's uh, one of the standard benchmark problems, the cart pole balancing problem, and uh, how uh, this is the performance of the RKHS system with this kernel matching pursuit against a more, a more standard natural gradient system or parameterized uh, system. 
uh, that uh, is unable to match this performance. So this is a uh, you know quite reassuring, um, and uh, this is another quite a uh, couple of standard benchmarks, a mounting car, again a quite significant hike in performance obtained through this uh, approach. Um, and finally, uh, a slightly more real world uh, example of controlling um, quadrocopters. Uh, so this is in a 13 dimensional space, state space with a three dimensional um, action space. The actual low-level actions of controlling the quadro quadro uh, copters is um, undertaken by a PID controller once the direction has been chosen. And the tasks are navigation, platforms navigate to a point, and a holding pattern where you have to stay in a circle uh, maintaining a minimum velocity. And again, on both tasks, this uh, uh, performance of the RKHS method appears to be uh, very competitive. Um, particularly in this holding pattern, which is quite a complex uh, problem. So it appears that the RHS uh, controller is actually better in high, higher dimensional state spaces. So it, it's sort of building on this intuition that even though the state space is high, the actual generalization from nearby states is strong. And if you pick the right points to represent the uh, the space, you can actually learn by just learning what to do at those points and generalizing across to the uh, neighboring points. Um, attempts so far to obtain similar results with deep learning have, um, have proved difficult, both for convergence and data sparsity reasons, partly because I think it's interesting, I mean, it's quite hard to get a lot of data here. It's, it's not a data-rich uh, environment, um, and perhaps that's an area where you know, deep learning might have uh, more difficulty. But, you know, that I'm sure that we'll get there with deep learning and, and maybe others have already. Uh, but at the moment, we're having a little bit of trouble. Uh, wanted, obviously, to do a comparison. Okay, so this is now moving on to a different uh, tack on this problem. Again, remind ourselves the, the problem we're looking at is how do we actually create deeper learning within kernel methods? And uh, sort of an obvious way to do this is to actually learn the kernel, right? That's an, an, a natural way. The kernel is defining this uh, fixed mapping. Um, and a natural way to do that is from probabilistic models. So we make some probabilistic model of our data and then use that to derive a kernel. And indeed, that was the method that I mentioned in, in, in computer vision, where you might learn a, f a probabilistic model of the patch uh, distribution and then take a Fisher kernel on top of that. Um, so if we consider learning a representation based on a probabilistic model, there are basically two methods of uh, defining kernels in terms of probabilistic model. There's this sort of averaging over a model class and then the Fisher kernels, which we've already heard about today and, uh, well, uh, Fisher vectors and uh, which, uh, as I say, we've already mentioned. So I'm going to concentrate on the Fisher kernel approach. And uh, I'll be just skip through a very, very quick example just to give you a flavor. I mean, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but just to take as a simple one-dimensional uh, input, and we take a Gaussian as our model of the data with two parameters, mu and sigma, uh, then the Fisher score is basically taken by computing the derivative of the log likelihood of the data in the model with respect to those parameters. So in this case, we move from a one-dimensional uh, feature into a two-dimensional representation. So we're mapping from one to two-dimensional space. And these are what the, if we set the mean and, and variance to be zero and one, we actually end up with this embedding. So this line is the embedding in the two-dimensional space of the one-dimensional input space. Now, I just wanted to give you a flavor of this because you can see the Gaussian here would be sort of centered at zero with a, 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 a variant, uh, sorry, a standard deviation of one. And so what's happening is that within the region where we're sort of seeing data we expect to see, the representation is pretty standard. But what it's doing is giving a, a big sort of hike to p examples that are outside of the expected region. So you can see it's quite an interesting thing for novelty detection. And this perhaps is an intuition of why 
it was particularly effective in object detection because if you think of patch, you know, the background distribution of patches, then you model that and then things that are interesting like objects like bicycles perhaps stand out as being unusual and then they're very easy to detect in the, um, by the classifier because they have strong features. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, yeah, I should have said that at the beginning. Very happy to take questions. Uh, you differentiate uh, log likelihood with respect to mu and sigma. Why not take uh, natural parameters of the Gaussian? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's, I think, what would happen if we use the Fisher information matrix. You can do that. I, um, just uh, generally speaking, people have used the simpler method of just taking the derivative with respect to the parameters. I, I'm not sure the advantages of either, to be honest. I, I'm not quite sure. OK, thanks. Okay. So here's another example of a Fisher kernel. Uh, and uh, we can view string kernels as Fisher kernels. If we think of them as being uh, strings as being generated by a Markov model, where we take the, um, the next character as being uh, conditioned on the previous k minus 1 characters. So if you look here, there's a document. It's generated by uh, adding a character at a time. So we have the product of the uh, characters being added from uh, the kth up to the final character. And basically, we have a probability of generating that character based, the next character based on the previous uh, k minus 1 characters. So that's the generative model, the, the model of the, of the um, now if we take the derivative of the log likelihood of that uh, under the uniform distribution, uh, and then we end up with the class of string kernels, contiguous string kernels. So it simply counts the number of occurrences of the different uh, k-length k-mers or k-length subsequences. Um, but now, looking at it in this way as a sort of a, a, a probabilistic model, we can actually learn that distribution that generates. So learn these parameters p rather than take them as a uniform distribution. We can actually learn them and, uh, if you like, attune this particular string kernel representation to the data that we're actually um, uh, considering in the particular application. Uh, we can also extend to a sort of finite state automata that generates the next character so that we uh, allow ourselves more flexibility about the length of these sequences. So these sequences could then be taken in some cases shorter, some cases longer. Um, and, and again, this can be learned based on the corpus. And uh, using that approach, we're able to, we were able to, this is uh, you know, quite an old piece of work, but it was, we were able to match the sort of bag of words approach uh, using TF-IDF without sort of building in all of that, if you like, heuristic information about the inverse document frequency and so on. So um, you know, again, this is showing how as perhaps a slightly more principled approach to building representations can be applied uh, in, in uh, this way. So, he, you know, perhaps the most obvious way in which, you know, kernel learning has, has moved into two-layer learning is multiple kernel learning. Um, so I want to quickly, you know, revi review that and then talk a bit about uh, uh, some, you know, analysis of that and, and its application and then move from there into how that can drive slightly more uh, deeper learning uh, approaches. So multiple kernel learning is basically the... the, the option of using a, uh, a kernel derived from taking a sum of a set of kernels where the uh, coefficients are uh, restrained to be positive and their sum is equal to one. So it's a one norm, if you like, combination of a set of kernels. And uh, the idea is that in the training, say of an SVM or a, or a re regressor, support vector regression or ridge regression, you actually adapt the obviously the, the the weight vector, but you also adapt the feature space in which that weight vector is uh, being learnt by adapting these uh, uh, parameters z t. So we learn both z t and the weight vector at the same time, and uh, it's sort of somewhat surprising when you first see it that this actually remains a convex problem. So we have a sort of larger convex problem that we're solving. Um, 
It would, however, appear that we are in danger of overfitting, particularly if this number of kernels, capital N here, uh, that I've de denoted was, was large. Um, so uh, there's a question of how performance scales with that uh, number of kernels. So I want to briefly kind of review some work that has, has examined that. Uh, using Rademacher complexity. So Rademacher complexity is uh, a measure of the flexibility of a function class that basically uh, looks at how well it can align with random noise. So here the um, sigmas are random plus minus one vector. Think of it, if you like, as a random labeling of the data. And we're asking how well we can correlate uh, our function class with the random, the chosen labeling, uh, or the expectation of that uh, correlation. Uh, so this is known as the Rademacher complexity of the function class. And uh, basically, there's a, a very nice result that relates the generalization of a learned function um, based on its empirical performance plus the Rademacher complexity plus a little extra term. I'll show it in a minute. But it's, this really is sort of the measure of how much we're likely to, if you like, overfit. Um, so in terms of multiple kernel learning, there's actually quite a nice way of viewing this, that we can think of it as the, we're learning in the convex hull of the union of the individual kernel spaces, where we're taking the individual kernel spaces to be uh, any function we can realize in the individual kernel, where we're restricting the norm of the weight vector to be less than or equal to one. So we have T, uh, sorry, capital N of these classes. We take the union of them. So just literally sort of, you know, take all those together and then take the convex hull. Now that's quite a nice way of looking at it because the convex hull, and, and sorry, this is, the, this is the bound. This is just the standard Radamaco bound that says that the probability of error um, on a test example is bounded by this empirical error, which is basically the you know, usual slack variables that we might use in a, in a support vector machine, these psi i's, this is the margin, and this is the Rademacher complexity of this union. Now, you may say, well, where did the convex hull go? The point about Rademacher complexity is that the Rademacher complexity of uh, a function class is uh, not changed if we take its convex hull. Um, so this actually, you know, taking all these sort of... Um, convex combinations of these functions doesn't actually increase the Rademacher complexity. So this is the, the, the result. And this is this extra term I mentioned, which relates to the probability of delta of being misled by the data. So it's a relatively small term. So to bound this uh, union, I mean, I, I won't go into detail, but there's just a, a, a quite uh, nice trick that you just take an, a single instantiation, random instantiation of the, those plus minus one vectors, and you can bound the Rademacher complexity in terms of its, uh, with high probability in terms of the empirical, uh, sorry, that particular alignment with that particular random vector sigma star. And uh, you can do that for both the full class and for each of the individual classes, bounding them one or the other way. And this allows you to put together basically a bound on the Rademacher complexity of this union in terms of the maximum of the Rademacher complexities of the individual classes. Um, and this extra term that involves a log of the number of kernels. So I think the, the, the take-home message here, when you put it all together, is that the bound is interestingly very dependent uh, on the, uh, sorry, very weakly dependent on the number of kernels. In other words, if we throw in a lot more kernels and as a result reduce the, uh, the margin, which is entering in here in, in, in these three terms, then we're actually, uh, you know, we need to make sure the kernels have, um, say, are normalized. If they're normalized, then this is just uh, uh, square root of m for all of the kernels. So uh, adding in many, many normalized kernels is really a very, if we can reduce the margin, is, is coming at very low cost. Um, so it's sort of logarithmic dependence on the number of kernels. And this actually, I mean, this... You know, as usual, the analysis sort of postdates the application, but here was actually a sort of uh, example of doing that that uh, showed really ex extraordinarily good results um, in the 
uh, visual objects challenge. This was a Pascal challenge in 2007. Uh, Vidaldi, these guys uh, um, applied multiple kernel learning with really quite a large number of kernels and got a, an extraordinary hike in performance. Obviously, you know, this is all history when you talk about deep learning, but still, this was a, you know, at that time quite an interesting, interesting result. So it sort of, let's say, motivates the idea that we can be a lot more generous with adding kernels. Um, this actually also motivates a, a new way of uh, tackling this uh, problem of multiple kernel learning, because we can th the way that the uh, theorem was proven, you thought about it as just as a, a set of weak learners, and you're just learning a convex combination of the weak learners, where the weak learners was the union of all of those functions uh, that could be realized by either any of the, uh, of the kernels with bounded norm. And uh, this is a sort of linear programming boosting approach, which basically uh, it's, it's similar to uh, just think of it as a one norm SVM, but doing column generation to generate the, uh, the weak learners. And the weak learners are determined by choosing the uh, maximum of this, uh, as you would with Adaboost, similar expression. Um, and each time you choose a new weak learner, you solve a, a linear program, and that then gives you this criterion for adding a new column. Um, now, the interesting thing is that we can actually write down exactly the best column to add. And uh, it's just as a matter of solving this uh, supremum here over this class of linear functions for a fixed kernel for the moment. Um, so I've just taken phi t as a fixed kernel here. This is the thing we want to maximize. We can move this sum inside the uh, inner product. Then the w is obviously must be chosen parallel to this. And the value is actually of that uh, supremum is equal to this. And uh, so we actually have an exact way of computing. And even though we have an uncountably many weak learners, we have a way of solving exactly the, the solution of that optimization. And this indeed is the, uh, the, weak, the, the weight vector that we need to choose. And it has this very convenient dual representation in terms of this weighting on the examples that was given by the boosting algorithm. So we can apply linear programming boosting to solve multiple kernel learning. But I think the important sort of perspective here that I like is that it sh suggests that this, uh, weight, this vector u can be seen as a signal that can be used to refine other representations. So we can sort of see it as, if you like, the back propagation signal into the kernel in order to adapt the kernel to the particular task. So it's uh, sort of making a, a, a multi-layer learning um, that, uh, that you know, is reminiscent of a, a deep learning type algorithm. Um, so just as an example, we could consider the Fisher kernel uh, as uh, over a parameterized probabilistic model. Now that signal u comes back and we use it to adapt the parameters of the, of the probabilistic model in order to improve the Fisher kernel for the task at hand. Um, so in, as an example, we, we did this in, in modeling, uh, using HMMs for modeling a time series data for forecasting foreign exchange rates, and then we're able to adapt and, uh, the uh, Fisher kernel based on this signal in order to improve performance. So these are a couple of publications on that topic. But I, I mean, I don't, I don't think they're, you know, the results were were solid but not groundbreaking, but I think the, the approach is certainly uh, an interesting approach in terms of seeing how we can use this sort of multiple kernel learning framework in an infinite set of classes to, uh, to learn in that way. So the final example I would like to give, by the way, how much time do I have now? Because I, okay, great. Um, is uh, in terms of learning um, the uh, input, so if we have a nonlinear kernel, like a Gaussian kernel, what we're interested in doing is selecting the features that are put into the uh, Gaussian kernel in order to do the learning. So learning, if you like, a sort of um, gating mechanism for the actual features that feed in. Now there's a nice result that uh, says that the um, uh, 
<clears throat> the best that we can do with a particular representation is uh, uh, in terms of this uh, correlation of uh, sort of, it's not quite, you know, it's not exactly what we would want to optimize in a support vector machine, but something similar is, is equal to this uh, if you, alignment uh, of the kernel with the labels. So the, there's a relationship between alignment uh, and, and the covariant, maximal covariance with the output. And this suggests that we can sort of measure the contribution of a feature by taking an expectation of uh, a random set of features with I, uh, a certain number of features, um, and uh, uh, sorry, including a certain set of a certain feature, and uh, a, a random similar random set not including that feature. And if you like, if this one is better, is bigger than this, in other words, if this CI is positive, then that feature appears to be a useful feature. Um, and here's just an example of where we can see this being uh, in, a, in a toy example with an XOR function which is dependent only on the first two examples. We can see that uh, we're actually culling features that are seen to be not useful, these ones with, say, negative uh, uh, correlations here. And uh, you can see the uh, two useful features emerging as dominant as we do that. Uh, so this is, uh, can be backed up by some analysis. Irrelevant features have negative expected contribution. Chances of relevant features being in the bottom quarter of ranked contributions is, is arbitrarily small. So we can cull the bottom ranked, uh, and we can even lock in some of the good, good top ranked features. So it's related to the <coughs> Hilbert Schmidt independence criterion, and it's been used for sort of greedy forward uh, addition of features or greedy backward elimination in this Fochsik and Bachsik uh, algorithms. The innovation here is to do probabilistic sampling of subsets in order to get this contribution uh, measured. And uh, so recursive feature elimination is a, a, a much more costly method that gradually removes features. And I've, this, I'm just mentioning these because I'm going to show you a comparison with them. Stability selection is uh, using one norm uh, regularization and, and subsampling to see which features appear good and uh, correlation coefficients are a, a simple baseline. So here's them, some results just to show you that this RAND cell is this method that seems to be working uh, reasonably competitively on, on simple problems but for instance XOR, FORSIC has no chance, BACSIC does well but so does this one and uh, on some more real world data we're getting again very competitive performance uh, using this this technique, um, and finally, we applied it to a deep learning challenge. Take them head on. Um, this was Black Box Learning Challenge in 2013. There was an additional sparse filtering step, so I have to admit there was one extra step here. But still, um, basically building on that, we used the culling idea, LP boost uh, MKL, uh, then based on the corresponding uh, uh, sets of features that were. Uh, produced, and uh, we were ranked actually third in the in the final ranking. So this was a, a paper on, on that. So basically, um, I think you know. Hopefully, I've given you a, a view of how different approaches have been taken to learning uh, deep representations for kernels. Uh, it's clearly vital for real world data, um, and. Uh, uh, obviously, in many cases, it seems to be uh, tackled in a fairly ad hoc manner in, in kernel practitioners. But what I've shown you, hopefully, is some examples of slightly more principled methods that have been rewarded with, with considerable success. Um, so there's a range of theoretical results that I believe start to build a support for this approach and place it on a, a, a firmer footing. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, two short questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I thought that one of the major limitations of kernel method is that the complexity of the you know, computation with respect to the size of the, the training data is a qubit. Mm -hmm. So any mm -hmm. of your extension address that issue? Well, the one I gave you with the... Um, uh, with the, uh, so, uh, the... The first one. The, 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 yeah, the reinforcement learning. And essentially, by doing that subselection of...
I see. The, f the examples, you then are actually computing only with those examples. Okay. So you, you get a speed up there. Yeah, so maybe there's one reason mm. why it loses to backpropagation you know, for neural network, because they take everything into account. Yeah. So if you don't really have to throw away that, in, in that case, if the data that you throw away, you didn't No, no, it here you're not throwing away, you're, losing. you're not throwing yeah. away the data, but you're building a representation, essentially a primal representation with, the, the with this subset one. of the data. I see. So, so you're not throwing away data, I see. but you are you know, making a, a compact representation in that I sense. I see, oh, but that's good, yeah, yeah. that's okay. great. Thank you. Thanks. So we are a bit late, if you don't have short questions, and thank you very much, and 